So in most computer systems today that are dominated by silicon, the disk drive is usually the last remaining mechanical component. Sure enough, some computers and servers still have internal tape drives, but that's not that common. Whereas mechanical disk drives inside of modern day servers is still very, very common. Now the major mechanical components of all disk drives include the following. Platters, the actuator, the spindle motor, the arms and the read-write heads. And the picture on the slide shows what those components look like if you take the lid off and then extract most of those internal components. Now when we refer to the disk drive as being the slowest component in any modern computer, that's led to a lot of people giving it nicknames. It's common to hear people refer to the disk drive using terms such as spinning rust, rotating rust, or as we've mentioned earlier, the three-legged dog of the computer. And they're funny, but to be honest, they do the disk drive a huge disservice. The disk drive, as we'll come to see as we investigate the mechanical components a little closer, is nothing short of a marvel of modern engineering. To put it into perspective, if we were to compare the performance of a mechanical disk drive, let's say to the performance of CPU or of RAM, it's not uncommon for the disk drive to be more than a thousand times slower than its silicon-based competitors. So let's take a closer look at the platters of a disk drive. The platters of a disk drive are effectively where the data lives. So this is where the ones and zeros that represent your data are stored. Now if you've ever seen a CD, a DVD or a Blu-ray disc, which I'm sure just about everybody has, the platter of a hard disk drive looks and feels very similar to those devices. An important characteristic of a hard disk drive platter is that it's rigid and that's where the name hard disk drive comes from. If anybody remembers the old five and a quarter or three and a half inch floppy disk drives that were not rigid, they were very different to today's hard disk drives. These platters are rigid. Now all modern disk drives contain multiple platters and all platters are stacked above each other in what's called a cylinder. Now the graphic that we've got at the bottom right hand corner of this slide shows two platters stacked directly above each other. And if you were to get a microscope out and take a look at these platters you would see that the surfaces are insanely flat and the absolute perfection and flatness of the surface of a disk drive platter is one of the reasons that we referred to the disk drive just a moment ago as being a marvel of modern engineering and we'll find out later why it's important that these surfaces are so insanely flat but as well as them being flat they spin and when I say they spin they spin like the wind the fastest modern disk drives spin at over 15,000 revolutions per minute now that translates to the outside edges of those disk drive platters spinning at over 150 miles an hour. Yeah, 150 miles an hour. That's over 240 kilometers an hour. Now we mentioned that data is stored as ones and zeros and that's the way the binary system works. All data that is stored on a hard disk drive is stored as ones and zeros. But actually, if we take a closer look, data is actually stored as electrical charges. A positive electrical charge might be considered as a binary 1, whereas a negative electrical charge may be considered as a binary 0. It's important as well to note that on disk drive platters, the top and the bottom surface are both used for recording, and this enables disk drive manufacturers to push maximum recording density out of each and every disk drive. So let's just do a quick recap on disk drive platters before we move on to looking at the read-write heads. The platters are effectively where the data is stored. We generally think of data as being stored as ones and zeros because computers use the binary system but actually data is stored as electrical charges, either a positive or a negative charge. These platters are rigid, they spin like the wind, they are insanely flat, and you can read and write to the top and the bottom of every platter in every disk drive. Alright then, let's take a look at the read-write heads. First of all, let's get a bit of language out of the way. Sometimes we shorten the term read-write heads to just heads, or sometimes we refer to them as RW heads. And that's normally done when we're writing, so we use r slash w heads. All of those terms refer to read-write heads. One of the first and probably the most interesting points about read-write heads is that they never actually touch the surface of the platter. 
However, they do hover insanely close to the surface of the platter, and the distance that they hover is referred to as the flying height. Now, the flying height is measured in nanometers, but it's vital to note that they never ever touch the platter. Well, occasionally they do, but if they do, then bad things happen. Usually, you're talking about lost data. If the heads touch the platter, we refer to this as a hard drive crash or as a head crash more technically. The point to note is if the heads do touch the platter then you've lost data and you've got a broken hard drive. And it's one of the most important reasons why you must always protect data that you store on hard drives. They don't fail very often but they do fail and when they do you usually cannot fix them. As we mentioned earlier Reading data from a hard drive is done by the read-write heads and what the read-write heads do is they detect the magnetic orientation of the particles that pass beneath them. Writing is similar, only this time the read-write heads change the magnetic orientation of the particles that pass beneath them and they do this by applying positive or negative electrical charges. So let's recap with a picture. First of all, the read-write heads never touch the platter surface. If they do, it's going to be a bad day for you if you haven't protected that data. Now, although they don't ever touch the platter surface under normal operation, they do hover insanely closely to the platter surface. And remember, we're talking nanometers away. As we can see in this picture, the distance between the read-write heads and the surface of the platter is less than a smoke particle. It's less than the depth of a human fingerprint, less than a dust particle, and way, way less than the diameter of a human hair. Again, another example of the precision engineering that is required to manufacture a hard disk drive. I mean, can you imagine trying to manufacture or make one of these bad boys on your own in your garage? It's just not going to happen. These are precision mechanical devices. So let's take a look at what controls the read-write heads. First up is the actuator. Sometimes this is called the head actuator and at this point actually if we take a look at the image that's on the deck at the top right hand corner of the deck what we'll see is that what we've been referring to so far as the heads or the read write heads is actually just the very tip of the actuator arm and as the heads sit right on the end of the actuator arm it's actually the actuator that is responsible for the physical positioning and movement of the read write heads. The logic that exists behind the positioning and operation of the actuator and therefore the read-write heads is referred to as the controller. And as we can see with the second image on this slide, the controller is not a mechanical component of the disk drive. Instead, the controller is like any other controller board that you would find in computing. It's got a mini CPU, it's got its own memory, and importantly, it runs the firmware of the disk drive. The firmware here being effectively the intelligence of the disk drive. And when we say intelligence, we're referring to things like monitoring the health of the drive, providing the block map that records where data is actually stored on the drive, and another vital role of the drive controller is providing the logical block address map or the LBA map of the disk drive. This LBA map is a simplified abstraction of the complexities of the disk drive. For example, Instead of exposing all of the physical details of the disk drive, such as the number of read-write heads, the number and size of each of the platter surfaces, the drive controller actually abstracts all of those complexities into what's referred to as the LBA map. And this is effectively just a simple virtualized address space, let's say from 00 through to 999, that anybody can use and refer to without having to understand the internal complexities of the disk drive. So to recap, the read-write heads sit right on the end of the actuator arm. The actuator arm and the actuator assembly controls the positioning of the read-write heads. The logic behind the controlling of the read-write heads and actually the logic behind all of the disk drive sits on the disk drive controller which is silicon based it monitors the health of the drive, it provides the abstracted address space of the drive, and it does all of the other clever intelligent things that modern disk drives do. 
Oh, and something else worth noting is that each disk drive has only a single actuator assembly. This means that every read-write head on that disk drive is connected to the same actuator. As a result of that, all of the read-write heads move at the same time, or they move in unison. The same goes for the platters themselves. All of the drive platters are connected to a single spindle motor. This means that when they spin or rotate, they all spin and rotate at the same time and at the same speed. Let's take a look at some protocols and interfaces. Before we go any further, it's probably worth defining what we mean by interface and protocol. By interface, we're referring to the physical connector on the back of the drive. And it's probably easy to think of a protocol as the language that the disk drive speaks. In the storage and the disk drive world, the physical interface of the drive that is, the physical connectors, and the protocol that the drive supports are both very tightly coupled. By this, we mean that the physical interface of the drive and the protocol go together. You wouldn't have a drive with a fibre channel physical interface using the SATA protocol. Fibre channel drives use the fibre channel protocol, and SATA drives use the SATA protocol. The one exception to this tends to be SAS, which can also speak the SATA protocol. Let's look at the major protocols and interfaces. First up is SAS. SAS stands for Serial Attached SCSI. Next up, we cover Serial Advanced Technology Attachment, sometimes referred to as either SATA, SATA or SATA. Then we have Fiber Channel, which we sometimes shorten to FC. And finally we have SCSI. SCSI is short for Small Computer Systems Interface. As we mentioned earlier, when we were talking about disk drive controllers, this is where all of the intelligence of the disk drive is implemented. The protocols, or the language that the drive speaks, is all implemented on the drive controller. And all four of the above protocols that we mentioned, SAS, SATA, FC and SCSI, are all both a protocol and a physical interface. As we mentioned with SAS, this is short for Serial Attached SCSI, now, what this means is that at the lowest level, SAS is still running the SCSI protocol. The same can be said about Fiber Channel as well. SAS is the mapping of SCSI over a serial protocol, and Fiber Channel drives map the SCSI protocol over the Fiber Channel protocol. SCSI itself obviously speaks native SCSI. Let's spend a quick minute on SAS. SAS is a serial point-to-point -point protocol that maps the SCSI command set and the SCSI protocol over a serial protocol. It's really common in high-end systems and SAS drives usually weigh in as one of the most expensive drive types. But hey, you do tend to get what you pay for here. The high performance and high reliability and that's what really drives the high cost. They're a good choice for tier 1 applications and mission critical workloads. Another important point to note about SAS is that SATA2 and SATA3 drives can be attached to and used by SAS systems. This makes SAS a very flexible protocol. Fiber channel drives are similar to SAS drives. They utilize the underlying SCSI command set and protocol and map it over a higher level protocol. This time the higher level protocol happens to be fiber channel protocol. Fiber channel drives are high performance, high reliability, and again, like SAS drives, high cost. However, fiber channel drives are far less popular than they used to be, and most vendors are replacing them with SAS drives. SAS and fiber channel drives tend to have the best build quality and use the highest quality components. This allows them to spin and rotate at higher speeds than SATA based drives. And it's this higher rotation speed that's a major factor in the higher performance that you see in SAS and fiber channel drives when compared to SATA drives. SATA drives Serial Advanced Technology Attachment are effectively the cheap and deep option. They tend to be lower cost, lower performance and potentially lower reliability. But they do come with massive capacities. Most of the multi-terabyte drives that we see today are SATA based drives. This means that the dollar per gigabyte cost of SATA drives is really really good when compared to SAS and fiber channel drives. However, the dollar per performance isn't so great. Traditionally, people haven't run mission-critical workloads based on SATA drives. However, more recently, they're proving really popular in scale-out architectures and cloud use cases. These are use cases and architectures where lots and lots of SATA drives are pulled together in order to increase performance and reliability. They also, in these cases, provide massive amounts of capacity. 
Traditionally, people haven't run mission-critical workloads against systems loaded with SATA drives, but more recently they are proving really popular in scale-out architectures and cloud use cases. These tend to be areas where lots and lots of these SATA drives are pulled together to increase performance and reliability, and they also, in these use cases, provide massive amounts of capacity. Now another drive type that's increasing in popularity at the moment is the Neoline SAS drive, which we sometimes shorten to NL SAS. These drives are hybrids between SATA and SAS drives. They have the physical interface of the SAS drive and they speak the SAS protocol, but they have a platter and build quality of a SATA drive. This comes across most notably in the rotation speed and in the capacity of the drive. SCSI drives are drives that are based on the SCSI protocol, of course, but also have a physical SCSI interface. They were really popular previously, but pretty much superseded by SAS drives. So as a quick recap on drive interfaces and drive protocols, it's fair to say that SAS and fiber channel drives are high performance but low capacity when compared with SATA drives, which are high capacity but low performance. And of course, let's not forget that the higher performance, lower capacity drives tend to be the more expensive ones. So you're going to have to put your hands deeper in your pockets if you want to buy SAS or fiber channel drives. Right then, let's take a quick minute to recap what we've learned so far about the physical anatomy of the mechanical disk drive. If we take the cover off a disk drive like we have done in the picture in the slide, we can see a lot of moving parts, and usually fast moving parts. Probably the first thing that jumps out to you, not literally I hope, is the platter. Each disk drive has multiple platters inside of it stacked vertically. The platter is where the data is recorded and each platter spins at extremely high velocities. Each platter is attached at the centre to the spindle motor which makes sure that all of the platters in the stack spin in synchronisation. Next we can see the actuator arms which have the read-write heads positioned at the end of them. These flick to and fro across the surface of each platter being extremely careful never to make contact with the surface of the platter. The read-write heads are responsible for reading and writing data to and from the platters. At the back end of the drive casing, this is on the top left hand side in our picture, is the physical drive interface. In this example it looks like a SAS interface, meaning that this drive speaks the SAS protocol and is a high performance, high cost drive. On the underneath of the picture in our example will be the drive controller board. This is the miniature computer that is effectively the brains of the disk drive. Now while this might have been a lot to take in, it's all absolutely vital to a solid understanding of storage and vital information for passing your CompTIA Storage Plus exam. And let's not forget, disk drives are amazing feats of modern engineering and modern manufacturing. Let's talk about feeds and speeds. 